will be transformed in the fury of Operation Desert Storm. January 17, 1991. In the early morning hours, an EF-111A Raven penetrates enemy airspace above western Iraq. Operation Desert Storm has kicked off. The air war is about to go hot. Captain Jim Denton maneuvers the Raven through the inky blackness, just 1,000 feet above the desert. The F-111 is really a Cadillac of low-flying airplanes. It was designed specifically to fly very stable at very high speeds and down low. In the right seat next to Denton is Captain Brent Brandon. While Denton pilots the Raven, Brandon's job is to blind Iraqi radar emitters with the big jet's powerful jamming gear. So we're like the blocking fullback that goes through the line and shuts down radars uh, so that the, the guys carrying the bombs can come in behind us, pop up, and then deliver the uh, ordinance. Denton and Brandon are at the tip of the spear with a large strike force in tow, targeting missile sites between a pair of Iraqi airfields. If they succeed, Denton and Brandon will carve an electronic swan through which F-15E Strike Eagles will safely pass to put laser-guided bombs on target. F-15C fighters fly top cover at 30,000 feet, added protection in case any American planes are jumped by the enemy. So we're embedded with 22 fire eaters out there going to take names and kick ass. In the cockpit of the Raven, Electronic Warfare Officer Brent Brandon goes to work. Well, they gave us 10 high-powered jammers, and those jammers are like flashlights, and when the radar tries to pick up the good guys, we blind them with this radar in the bomb bay. The ALQ-99 computerized jammer instantly zeroes in on the radar frequency. Brandon releases megawatts of radiated energy. You know, hair comes up on the back of your neck, and the jet starts to crackle with all this electronic energy, and uh, it literally feels electric. The Iraqi radars are blinded. The strike eagles are cleared hot and begin hitting their targets. We're between the two largest airfields at 5,000 feet. We are in the front row seat in Desert Storm. Their anti-aircraft radars gone, the Iraqis desperately scramble jets against the intruders. About two minutes later, two caps are airborne for the Iraqis. One of them comes out of the H-2 airport, one of them comes out of the vicinity of Baghdad. The crew gets an unfriendly hit on their radar acquisition warning system. An Iraqi Mirage F-1 rolls in from above and behind the EF-111. Denton and Brandon are in serious trouble. The Raven was never meant to dogfight. The EF-111A is an electronic warfare variant of the F-111 Aardvark fighter bomber. Nicknamed Sparkvark, all armament was removed to make way for the radome on the underside of the fuselage that housed transmitter antennas and the pod on the vertical stabilizer that housed receiving antennas. The Dassault Mirage F-1 is a French-built single-seat air superiority fighter. The Iraqis had over 100 F-1s in their arsenal, and they used them with great success in the Iran-Iraq war. In a dogfight, the Mirage has every advantage. It has a faster rate of climb, far greater agility, and is heavily armed with 30-millimeter cannon and air-to-air missiles. The Raven 
is completely unarmed. The mirage closes in from 5 o'clock high on its helpless prey. Jim Denton will have to survive by his wits. I felt based on our training, we could beat it, just straight up, and get away from it. And that was our primary job, to get away from it, to get our jammers back on, and get back to work. So what I did was I just snapped this inverted and just started a left turning slice back to the left. It's a simple defensive move that will hopefully position the Americans' jet engines out of the line of fire of the Mirage's heat-seeking missiles. But the Iraqi jet is already in radar missile range. The menacing tone of a radar lock pulses into Denton's headset. Looking over his right shoulder, Brandon spots the missile flash. It's like someone looking in a dark night and watching someone light a cigarette and then watching the cigarette come towards you. And I hear missile launch right side. I'm going, what? He says, missile launch right side, break right. So at this point, I'm completely blind at 400 feet at night, and I've got a missile coming at me. Denton snaps the big raven to the right, pulling with all his strength. By breaking sharply into the threat, Denton is attempting to overwhelm the missile's electronic circuitry. It's a highly dangerous maneuver. You're basically doing a high rolling, high G turn, down low. Denton and Brandon take five Gs of abuse, the maximum their aircraft can sustain. You can have soft G or you can have hard G, and this was some hard G. Brandon pumps out chaff strips of aluminum meant to confuse the warhead. The tactic works. The missile streaks past the Raven and disappears into the night. But the Mirage is still on the Raven 6 and not about to give up. Luckily, the cavalry arrives. An F-15C, piloted by Robert Grader, is on a cap mission high above the dogfight. Grader has already bagged one F-1 tonight and quickly locks the second Mirage up, preparing for a long-range Sparrow missile shot. Grader is here. The Mirage is here, behind Denton and Brandon's Raven. The Iraqi pilot, already target fixated on the Raven, now has to deal with the piercing shriek of Grader's missile lock in his headset. He momentarily loses his situational awareness. A fatal mistake at 400 feet. In a sudden brilliant flash of light, the Mirage slams into the ground. We saw the fireball just spit out in front of us. It slid and hit in front of us about 2 o'clock, right 2 o'clock. Grader, the F-15 pilot, is credited with the victory. But Denton and Brandon are awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for their role in the maneuvering kill. The Mirage F-1 was more than a match for an unarmed F-111. But when they came down to play in our environment, um, they paid the cost on it. The mission on the morning of the 17th is a complete success. The 671 combat sorties that night are the first combat test of a bold new strategy in aerial warfare. American tactics and technology in the 1980s and 90s were shaped by the lessons learned during the Vietnam War. The previous generation of fighter pilots had not been trained in air combat maneuvering. They were forced to fly aircraft that were not specifically designed to dogfight. All of that had changed by 1990. By 1990, with the Gulf War, the Air Force and the Navy had advanced on two fronts. One is they had advanced new fighters like the F-15 air superiority fighter and the F-14 interceptor fighter. 
In addition, they had much better weapons. The Sparrow had improved, the Sidewinder had improved, and the pilot training had considerably improved. When Saddam Hussein seized Kuwait on August 2nd, 1990, and the drums of war began to beat, American air power faced its greatest threat in decades. The Iraqis had MiG-29 interceptors, they had MiG-23s, they had French F-1s, and pilots and ground commanders had experience fighting with the Iranians. Thus, the U.S. really organized in a way to create an overkill situation where we had to use all of our assets against a prepared adversary. Electronic warfare aircraft could block enemy radars and clear corridors of attack for bombers, whose precision-guided munitions could take out command control centers and anti-aircraft defenses. Oh, AWACS could monitor the situation, calling out any airborne enemy aircraft to American fighters who could take them on. Tankers could feed the beast, keeping the entire war machine flying for hours on end. Special force was championed by Air Force.